are a perfect complement to the lesson that we will study together. I thank you, Daryl, for your good job in the selection of these songs, the opportunity to sing and to worship our Heavenly Father. And tonight we're talking about this lesson. Study with me as we think about Jesus, the Son of God, and the Son of Man. The first thing I would say is, and I believe you will agree with me, it is important that we understand, that we know and understand who Jesus is. All that he said he was, all that he claimed to be, and all that he became, and all that he did, as he left heaven and came to this earth. And so we're talking really about two things, are we not? You're immediately thinking with me, and appropriately so, we're thinking about the deity of Jesus Christ, and we're thinking about the humanity of Jesus Christ. To set the foundation for our study, let's think about the Son of God, the Son of Man. And you can see these passages before you, perhaps if you picked up this bare bones outline that are provided, outlines that are provided back in the uh, foyer on the table. If you didn't get one, you can get one later. But anyway, an audience like this, uh, it helps me because we have the advantage of being familiar with such passages as John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so it is, we're talking about Jesus Christ, the Word, the Logos. We're talking about deity. We're talking about the fact that indeed Jesus Christ is divine. He is himself God. And then we know what John 1.14 says. John 1.14 says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. And so it is, you have the advent of he who was the Word, the Logos, before time began, from the very beginning, has always been, and shall always be, and now you have the Word becoming flesh and dwelling among men. And so it is, how can this be? We wonder about these things as we think about all that God is doing and all that we read about concerning Jesus Christ as he was here upon this earth. Here is a passage, and I think we can just turn over there and look at this passage. Uh, perhaps we're familiar with it. I'm sure that we are. Talking about, of course, the virgin birth of Christ. There are a lot of people that do not believe who Jesus is as the divine Son of God, the claim that he made to be divine. But nevertheless, here is a passage that sets forth how, how deity and humanity came together. That's the virgin birth of Christ. Matthew 1, 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And so that, of course, is from Isaiah 7, and verse 14. And again, an audience like this, you've read that passage and studied all of that before. And then here is another passage that is foundational to our consideration of who Jesus Christ is when he was indeed in heaven, and he left heaven, and he came to this earth. I'm turning now, perhaps you are as well, to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 it is, beginning in verse 5. It says, Let this man be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So here now we have a human being as Jesus consciously, it was a conscious decision upon his part. We have a human being. You have somebody who came from heaven to this earth to accomplish the eternal purpose of God. Uh, you think of the eternal purpose, you might think of Ephesians 3 and verse 11, the book of Ephesians particularly. So we're talking about the deity of Christ, we're talking about the humanity of Christ. How did Christ get here? How can we try to grapple with the idea, the concept, that you now have God in the flesh? And then here you have in the Philippians passage, here you have Jesus humbling himself, giving up his life, dying on the cross, dying for you and dying for me. All of that, of course, the end result is accomplishing God's eternal purpose in his Son. Transition from all of that. 
I want us to think about the fact that now we're talking about the dual nature of Jesus, that is. It is certainly true, is it not? Uh, many times, and many people have a difficult time seemingly reconciling the dual nature of Christ. To put it another way, just how can it be that you have deity on this earth, God in the flesh? How can you have God and how can you have man? How indeed can that be? I want us to think about this. The Bible teaches that Jesus is indeed God and that Jesus is indeed man. We're talking about as he leaves heaven and comes to this earth. Now we're I'm not talking really about him going back into heaven where he is now by the right hand of God, but we're trying to understand who he is and what he became, so we're talking about the humanity and deity of Christ. How can this be? The New Testament tells us that indeed here is God and here is man, that Jesus is both God and Jesus is man. The reality, of course, is that you and I, we're not the first people, we're not the first generation to ever wrestle with this issue, trying to understand, <coughs> excuse me, how indeed can it be? When you talk about the Gnostics, you're familiar with the Gnostics, you see in the word Gnostic, you see the Greek word Gnosis, and here's the idea of knowledge, and the Gnostics said, we know something you don't know, we have a special knowledge, and if you're going to be elevated spiritually, you've got to come to us, and we're going to teach you, and we're going to teach you all over again, the ABCs of this whole universe. Uh, people thousands of years ago wondered about these same things that you and I wonder about. The Gnostics, of course, viewed the flesh as being intrinsically, inherently evil. And let's just give them credit to say, perhaps we could give them credit to say, they are grappling with the idea of who is, who is Jesus Christ. So we can at least give them a little bit of credit for trying to work through these issues. But what they said is that here you have, you have Jesus Christ in the flesh. That can't be because the flesh is inherently evil. And so they denied that Jesus had come in the flesh. Uh, they didn't want to think evil of Jesus. Right? How could they say that? How could they believe that? Uh, of course, all of these are controversies. Again, we're not the first folks ever upon the scenes of mankind to wonder or to wrestle or to argue even about these issues. I'm turning now. We can do this rather quickly. You can study the book of Colossians. Sometimes we say in the first century you have incipient Gnosticism which means you have the beginning stages of Gnosticism. From our study of church history, or whatever that means to you, I'm trying to put that in quotation marks, when you study what men have said and asked the questions and, and argued about, full-blown Gnosticism didn't take place really until the second century, really the latter half, I think, of the second century. But anyway, you have the beginning stages because you have, for example, in the book of 1 John, I think I did say that, look at 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 helps us understand about here you have some folks who are denying that Jesus had come in the flesh. Verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit that tests the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. But this you know the Spirit of God. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is already in the world. We can back up. There's no end to this if we wanted to make an entire lesson study, and maybe we do that sometime, about who John is talking about. Look in 1 John 2.22. 1 John 2.22, he was a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. All of these passages in 1 John, now let me start all over. Many of these passages in 1 John, 2 John 7 is another passage that I have here in my notes. All of this says there are people who believe, there were people who believed that the flesh uh, was in, intrinsically, inherently sinful, 
And therefore, Jesus did not come in the flesh. He's just kind of a spirit or a ghost or a phantom of some kind. We don't want to think evil of Jesus, and so we're going to deny that he had come in the flesh. I'll say this, and then we'll continue. We get exercised, maybe appropriately so, but we wonder, what about the Antichrist? Is the Antichrist Russia, the, the Kremlin, or, uh, you know, some people believe that uh, 666 Ronald uh, Wilson Reagan was the Antichrist. So you have all these kinds of things uh, perpetrated by people thinking in it. John says the Antichrist, and there's not just one Antichrist, there are many Antichrists. There are many people who were denying that Jesus had come in the flesh. That's a beginning place, it looks like to me, for a better understanding about the Antichrist. But I'll leave that for another time. And then modernists, modernists, even them and even today, do not believe that Jesus is divine. Modernists believe that Jesus, they might say that Jesus, well, he was a good man, he taught some good things, but he is indeed not God's son, he is not divine. Now, my interaction as I think about these things and talk to people about these Bible subjects, uh, it, is it unthinkable? We, we say it's just unthinkable that Godhood and manhood could be united in a single person and walk upon this earth. And we're trying to explain the, the, the dichotomy, the, the difference between that. Uh, see if you agree if I said this. The New Testament doesn't stop to argue about the dual nature of Jesus. What the New Testament says to you and me is that you have God in the flesh. We say, how can God leave heaven and come to this earth and be God in the flesh? And what about this and what about that? But the reality is, the New as far as I can tell, I can be corrected on this. I'd be glad to be so if that's the way it is. But the fact of the matter is, the New Testament doesn't stop to argue about the dual nature of Jesus Christ. What the New Testament says is God left heaven and came to this earth. The Word became flesh and dwelt among men. We preachers, of course, uh, can complicate things by trying to explain too much. I'll take the blame if that's uh, what is helpful. Uh, some of you will remember, I <laughs> keep saying you old timers, I'm an old timer now. You remember who Robert F. Turner was, the uh, highly esteemed preacher, Vernon, Texas, many times. Preached all over Texas, all over the world for that matter. But anyway, he is famous. We remember him for saying something like this. We try to whittle on God's end of the stick. That is, we try to say more or even less than God said. So the reality is we're trying to explain how can it be. Well, it is. That's what the New Testament says. That is, here you have both natures, if you will, divine and human, found in Jesus, and there's not a conflict between them. We say, how can it be? Just accept the fact that's the way it is. That's what the New Testament says. And then I would have you think with me about this. Let's think about Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. And of course, now we're thinking about the humanity of Jesus. The phrase Son of Man is a self-designation used by Jesus. Uh, if you take the time to study this, I can read what others have written, as can you. In the Son of Man, that phrase, some say, is found 85 times in the New Testament. 81 times used by Jesus himself, the other four times used by other people in reference to Jesus. Now, I'm, uh, look in Matthew 16. I guess that's what I'm looking for. Look at Matthew chapter 16. Oh, it's just a helpful passage because Jesus is trying to elicit from his disciples as to his identity. He'll soon go away. They need to know who he is. And so it says, Matthew 16, 13, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who do, who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, I thought he's the Son of God. Well, he is the Son of God. And that designation is used, but now he says, I indeed am the Son of Man. Uh, you have, for example, in the book of Revelation, you have John seeing Jesus as the Son of Man standing where? 
standing among the lampstands. The lampstands are the seven churches of Asia. Uh, you remember what Stephen saw as he's being stoned in Acts 7? He said that he sees the Son of Man in heaven. And so you put all that together, and I think, at least in part, we still wonder. But you don't have a lot of explanation, even from Jesus, as to what that means. And so the Son of Man is used in reference to the Messiah. And we're talking about you 